who sold food for the city, which is a program where we get to interview some of the city's best chefs, musicians, and artists to learn more about them and their spirituality and their creative process and what inspires them so that we can learn from them and our souls can be nourished from them and if we're lucky we might even get an actual recipe or some ideas for food so um, with that i know that you all are eager to join me in welcoming chef anush um, shariat who is uh, one of my favorite chefs in the city and um, who has kindly graced us with an opportunity to talk with him. So Chef Anush, welcome. Thank you and I'm honored to be part of it. Uh, this is indeed a highlight of my, my life. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. Um, and for those of you who don't know Chef Anush, he has um, currently Anusha's Bistro and um, Nushnosh, both on Brownsboro, you know, Brownsboro. 42. And um, he'll tell us maybe a little bit more about those and some of what led him to Louisville. Um, but if you've never been there, then you've missed out on the opportunity to be warmly embraced as soon as you arrive first by the warmth of the people who are there, and then as soon as you are lucky enough to eat by the delicious food and beverages that you can have there. Um, so Chef Anush, um, I'm wondering if you can share a little more about sort of yourself and what led you both to Louisville and also to cooking. Well, I've been, uh, I had an opportunity, and now it's about 30, 31 years ago. I was living in Dallas, Texas, and uh, uh, a gentleman named uh, Charles Osborne uh, had a restaurant here, and he, he was looking for somebody to just, uh, you know, take it to the, pick it, you know, take it over and, you know, get it to the next level. We, um, we made a conscious decision to move here because of, uh, I was expecting my first child, and uh, and I thought we wanted to be a smaller city to, uh, you know, and it was closer to my wife's family and so on. So that's what how I ended up in Louisville. But um, as life turns, uh, we, we uh, at the Remington's restaurant went very greatly, and then we sold, they sold, and then... I had an opportunity to open my own restaurant, Chariots, and then a Park Place. Then we had a brewery, so life goes on. And now we have Nush Nash, which is an all-day oven, all kinds of goodies. You can get breakfast, lunch, dinner. And then Bistro is kind of um, allows us to take advantage of some of the unique product that is uh, around the world and locally to bring them on the plate to guests. Absolutely. I would say that the, some of the best pizza in town and definitely the best breakfast pizza I've ever had Thanks. can be found at Nushnosh. Um, so, and, uh, you know, I'm wondering how you have two very different concepts and what inspired you to kind of branch out with both of those. I was always, um, uh, and strangely enough, when I went into uh, cooking, as you asked earlier, it's... Uh, I ended up a lot in um, in a more up, upscale dining, or you know, to, I don't want to call it fine dining, but uh, it's a more serious food uh, preparation, if you will. And um, but also chefs, they really like to eat food, and a lot of times those foods are a great sandwich, a good pizza, or you know, fried fish, whatever it is. And I think that's the inspiration for Nushnash. It was uh, all the food that I want to eat on a daily <laughs> basis, you know, uh, it's uh, because, uh, you know, it's, it's great to have all those exotic menu items, but those are, you know, it's not homey. It's not, uh, those are not special all occasions. food can be, yeah. We need that nurturing, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, your uh, childhood memory is pretty important. And a lot of the foods we do, we try to hit those uh, notes where 
you know, whether it's mac and cheese or whether it's, uh, you know, a, a soup that your mom made and, or the grilled cheese. I mean, you know, because that takes you back and gives you uh, also a warm feeling. I'm, uh, I'm a habit thinker of um, the cook, put the cooks, they put energy into the food when they prepare it. And I think uh, always when I did cooking classes, I, I asked my uh, individuals that were there, the students, what have you, they said, if you're mad or pissed off, do not cook. Because what you're doing is you're just sending that energy into your food. Mm. So cook with love, with gracious, be gracious about it. Be, I think there is a, um, a relationship between us and preparing a meal because you have to think through it. You have to, uh, and putting love to it, meaning well, you know, picking the best pepper or, uh, you know, looking for that beautiful, you know, red tomato or even, you know, gardening, trying to find the best herbs that you can freshest. Those are, those are passion. Those are love. I mean, and I, I think that's really translates into the food. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's so powerful, this idea that the food that you're serving is filled with this loving energy and definitely um, our world needs a lot of loving energy right now more than ever. Um, what helps you stay centered and focused on love and positivity as part of your creative process? Do you have any personal uh, spiritual practices or is it just one of absolutely. God's gifts that God gives you this shining light that emanates or? You know, I'm very grateful. I'm very, you know, I count my blessings. I think every day, I, and this is something I had to learn. I mean, you know, uh, we, we are told what, you know, how to be thankful and all that, but we have to learn it. And uh, I think, and being uh, through a lot of different turmoils and events and serious things, I think uh, being grateful for what we have, what we can do. I mean, this moment with you, uh, it is a, a unique experience in our life. And we have many of those moments. But if we're not grateful, we won't notice them. We just, you know, be, there'd be another mirage. It came and went. I think we spent, we, 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 we look at a tree, but we don't see it. We, we look at a flower, but we don't see it because we, we don't spend time to look at the relief and say, wow, how did that get there? You know, mm -hmm. and uh, even thank the, the plant for the beautiful gift of the flower because I think uh, that's what nature is. Nature gives us such a gift every day and we need to be more aware of it and that's what I try to do. I try to Zen. I mean um, I think spirituality is, uh, is important and but it doesn't have to have a big system. It's about being kind. It's been about uh, being uh, compassionate and uh, you know uh, we 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 know how to love, and that's you know, and we can choose a lot of times to love or hate. To me, there's nothing in between. Mm. You know, I, I I live my life. I always tell my uh, my friends. I said, you either for something or against something. You can't be in the middle. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. <laughs> so I always choose to the to go to the direction of love and a happier moment. I mean. Yes, I have a lot of tough things or events and pain, if you will. But then also there's a lot of great. You can leave that and embrace things that are, that are beautiful and great about it, especially in our lives. Yeah, no, absolutely. The culture of gratitude is definitely an important spiritual practice. And, you know, I was thinking about what you said about how just paying attention is so important. And I think, especially when it comes to food, a lot right. of times 
people eat, you know, I think like I saw a statistic that more than a third of our food is consumed in the car as we're driving. And rarely do we get a chance to season and taste and really feel the experience of eating. And when you go to a restaurant like at Anusha's Bistro, it's this chance to really have a full experience of sitting and and um, tasting and sensory. It's not just the food, but it's everything around you. Right, uh, being present, I call it. If you're present, uh, because when your food comes to you, you just, that whole energy, that whole, you know, granted we, nowadays we take pictures, but uh, I think it, this picture is here. It just mm. just uh, take it in and, uh, uh, and be uh, be able to uh, be appreciative. I think uh, it's very important because uh, for me, when we're talking today, it's it's very hard because uh, a lot of people are in hard times, and uh, and that's more reason I was brought up uh, and said that you have to be appreciative, even if you're eating a piece of bread or a cracker, if you will, and. Um, chew it and think about it, you know, I'd be grateful because, you know, somebody had worked hard to get that there. And, you know, and we forget because we're living in a fast world. And as you said, you, uh, I was against always eating in the car. I mean, I know sometimes you got to do it, but to me, you get up and you have your breakfast in the car. The most important meal that you need to zen with or nourish your body, get their uh, uh, body kick started for the morning. You need to Zen about it, you know? And if you believe in prayer, say a prayer about it. And because that sets up the day, that really opens up. I mean, we got up, you know, we grab a piece of toast out of the toaster, run to the car, trying to comb our hair. And then we're mad because there's cars on the road and then you get to work and you, you say, why am I having a bad day? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So we're, well, we created it. I believe we're, uh, anything we, any energy we put out, that's what you receive. So I'm careful about not putting negative energy out there. Mm -hmm. Do I have bad days? Absolutely. I get up days that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, you, you, you want to say, well, I don't I want to just sleep. I don't want to get out. But then I, you know, look around, say, you know what? I want to go and be productive or, you know, see people. And I'm very blessed because I'm in a business to see a lot of people on. The best part is they're, they're coming there willingly Mm -hmm. to to enjoy something or celebrate you know and that's what a what a way to to work you know mm -hmm. it's uh certainly been a challenge for restaurants right now in the midst of this pandemic with this idea that we should stay away from one another um, when so much of being in the restaurant business is about coming together um how have you and your team fared and what are some thoughts you have about starting this new chapter as we slowly reopen right. um, are are there things that you're going to be doing differently or well i mean really the, uh, there's no book about this one and uh there's no rules uh first of all the way it closed it was shocking to just get through that and trying to put it in a perspective for yourself because it doesn't matter our business or anything else. You work so hard and all of a sudden somebody comes, turns the lights off, locks the door, you're done. And then the worst part is this is your livelihood. You're trying to figure out. And it's hard, I mean, to go through that process. I always told my friends, and I said, it's kind of like a grief. You know, you go through the six, seven steps mm -hmm. of it. And one of the things I was able to do right away, and it, it hit our, our staff very hard. I mean, 
uh, and a lot of them, they don't have much savings or, you know, and uh, to their choice, you know, they, they just like to come in and make the money and leave and not have responsibility according to them, but, but they do, it's a, it's a serious job. So they, they it will hit them very hard. And so one of the message I gave them, uh, and this was, we're not thinking about we're closing, we're thinking about how we're gonna open. So right away, then, then two days later, that's what we talked about. We, you know, what, how we're gonna open and what we're gonna do. While we were thinking, I wanted them to think about the other end of it, not as an end, rather than as a beginning. Mm -hmm. So ha having that mindset that allowed me and also them to, to sit around and say, okay, well, well, what kind of menu we're gonna do? We're gonna do the whole menu and then, we realized uh, restaurants are not going to open all the way, or you can have curbside, and we've never done curbside like this. I mean, we we do to go meals all the time, but now we have to learn how to take the food and get it to your car, and still be the food that we want to give you. And those brought whole new challenges, and uh, so I asked them to embrace the challenges and find solutions. You know, so how we can do this better? How our food can get to your home, to your car that is, you know, say, oh, this is, this is pretty close. It's not the same, but it's close. We, uh, and uh, really, uh, again, bottom line is, um, you gotta think positive because if I think of doom days, I mean, then we can reopen, you know, because, you know, and if I taught that way, I never would have opened a restaurant. Mm. <laughs> because restaurants are tough. I mean, they're not normal. I mean, they're uh, not normal. <laughs> <laughs> and one of, the, one of the sayings we have, we say, oh, I always have a job. I can always go somewhere and cook and make money. But we realize when they close everything, we can't even do that. You know, so you, the reality has changed for mm -hmm. all of us that, even doctors couldn't practice, you know, because, hey, you can't have procedures or what have you. Mm -hmm. I have friends that, you know, they couldn't even <laughs> see patients. So it, it really brought a new reality to our community and, and around the world that how uh, vulnerable we are and how much we need each other. And if that bond, you know, is not uh, strong, if we can't take care of each other, it's, uh, it's not, we're not gonna survive. And, uh, and to the point that, you know, my vendors, for instance, we, you know, we always try to get best deals, what have you, but they didn't realize that, uh, oh, uh, you know, if they get, get my account, they get another account, they didn't care. But all of a sudden, mm -hmm. every account counts because mm -hmm. we all matter in a bigger, bigger scheme of things because mm -hmm. we, we, we make it all work. Every restaurant, every uh, grocery store, every you know, cleaners, every, I mean, every church, I mean, every uh, temple, every uh, Knesset. I mean, really, uh, they, we need each other. And uh, at the end of the day, it's uh, to, to go through it, again, we needed each other to get through it. So we brought our staff together and we made it, uh, we made them just as part of the solution. Well, to, and how beautiful that, that notion of that, that this has made us think about our fragility and made us appreciate Whereas before, oh, I'll get another client or I'll get another vendor or whatever, and to realize how interdependent we are in the midst of this. Um, and I know, you know, listening to you and, and the choice that you make every day to see things in a positive light and to try to find something constructive, I know that that's something that um, I'm sure that you learned early. Um, I don't know if it's just something you were born or your family inculcated it in you, but it's, uh, it's a lesson that not everyone has. It, and, or it's like a reflex almost. Right. And, and I, I'm wondering if you can share sort of well, where my you parents, that. 
my parents were very compassionate. I think my father was very given, almost too much, where he would go broke. <laughs> I mean, he would, uh, uh, if you, on the street, if somebody asked for his jacket, he would take it off. Uh, and then comes home, my mom said, where is your jacket? I said, well, somebody needed it. <laughs> so, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, with that culture, um, uh, I think that was embedded in me to be kind, to be uh, in service in a way, but also um, uh, be mindful of people's feelings uh, and also be given. Um, a lot of times we feel like when we give, I give you a gift. I mean, whether it's cash or uh, jewelry, that's not the gift. I think the gift is the energy that we share that I give with the, all my heart and my you know mind that you feel it when you walk in a room if the if the person is just inviting you feel it you go in a room that is cold we always said evil is cold well that's because the energy is not there we're not we're not releasing it we're holding it I think uh, 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 it took me a while to understand it in these terms, you know, because, uh, you know, a lot of times we look to you all and say, well, tell me how I should feel or how I should be connected to the higher power, or, you know, <coughs> excuse me. But we are... Uh, uh, we ask it, but we don't take the time to say the energy is within us and we have to find it. And over the years, listening to a lot of great individuals, um, whether, whether it was clergy or whether it was uh, 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 big minds, if you will, or President Gandhi for, was one of my huge uh, influencer because he uh, took it to the letter when he said, and this is really current, with current times, it's very uh, relevant that, you know, um, I have to accept everybody and everything. You know, I can't just accept one person or the other or one race or the other. And so that was really one of the things that I, I started thinking about and you know the whether it was Taoism, whether it was uh, Judaism, whether it was Christianity, whether it's Islam or Baha'i. I mean I uh, my father was really well read and he had uh, all three holy books memorized. Mm -hmm. So uh, but he inter he he had a hard time when it got interpreted in a wrong way, <laughs> mm -hmm. which it can happen. I always say I read a letter to you and you interpret what I read and then you take something else out of it. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very um, uh, well established where we can interpret everything the proper way or find out the meaning of it. And um, a verse of Rumi, for instance, you can interpret it many different ways. Mm -hmm. And everybody is right or the, the way they interpret it, the way they feel, you know. Mm -hmm. But again, it's very important that we, uh, we learn to, to be compassionate. And I think we teach our kids a lot of times that not, that's not the great thing. And uh, by, because being competitive is important, is good. I totally get it. You got to have that competitive edge, and but you have to do it with a mindful, mm -hmm. where you know you don't destroy a life to gain your life, you know. And I'm very aware of that. That's uh, for me. That's that's the value that I want to live by. And everybody's different, but I don't. Uh, and I think that comes from my parents. I hope so. Well, and that's so beautiful as you were talking about how different people can take, take the same religious teachings and interpret it. They bring their own stuff to it. It was sort of me thinking, I was thinking of, you know, two different chefs that could take the same ingredients, but 
depending on the energy that they bring to it, that would determine what, whether it was food that was nourishing to the soul or what right. it was and how, how much of that has to do with what you, what is in your heart. And I wonder, I wonder, um, when you create a dish, right. like what is your creative process? Like, how do you go about, like, what is your, <laughs> what is the dish that is on your menu that you are most proud of? And how did you come about to create it? Because I know sometimes, you know, oh, what am I going to have for dinner? And like, it's not, it's, it's hard to kind of get into that creative space. Well, I always say need is mother of inventions. And uh, in a way, you can say when you do in a dish, as when I cook, you're inventing, you can invent something new or you can follow a recipe or you take a recipe and you adjust it and give it your own touches. So uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, what, what we learned in the past, as far as what food and what, you know, techniques, whether uh, you're exposed to, let's say, kind of like religion, whether it's Eastern philosophy or <laughs> Western or Central, I mean, so all these flavor, all these uh, different ingredients. Um, and for me, it's always the creative process comes two ways. One is we, we have time and I create a menu. And that, that takes a few, a few couple of weeks. And what we do, we write it on a paper, we draw it out, we, we put the ingredients. Then, of course, you know, what, sometimes I take the ingredients and I cook it and then write it down. So uh, those are the two ways. But more, more importantly is when, uh, when you, for, I always encourage people when they go to the refrigerator or let's say you start with a recipe. To me, recipe is a map for you to get somewhere. That map, uh, you, you can add things to it. Now, let's say it's chicken, you can add beef. Uh, if, if you don't have beef, you you know you do tofu, whatever it is, and adopt it. I think we need to adopt, and a lot of cooking is adaptation of different things. And uh, for me, always is the start with main ingredients, and then um, try. Uh, one thing I learned throughout cooking, uh, if you start with a good thing, you, didn't, you don't need to mask it. You don't mm -hmm. need to cover it up. We, we always have a saying in the kitchen, we say, if you have a bad meat, you cover it with sauce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when I, my first focus always is find the freshest the best. And, uh, and that sometimes, if it's not fresh and you're going to grocery, Frozen is okay, but make sure it's not frozen for 10 years. Or it's funny because we think beans, for instance, you go buy beans and you say, well, beans, beans and beans, but there is a difference between a bean that is two years old and six months aged, uh, mm. a rice that is aged is has a different flavor and cooks differently. Mm. So we, knowing about product helps, but I think, um, Again, being in tune with, uh, with, the, with the ingredient and trying to really complement it. So let's say lamb, you take a lamb and you, uh, you, we know how to sear it off. We know how to season it with different spices, aromatics and herb. I think that those are all the extra notes because lamb is your in instrument and <laughs> you add the notes to it. So bringing in all those uh, <clears throat> beautiful spices or ingredients in there, now that you, you, have, a, you have a melody. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the only way I can describe it because uh, it is, as you said, is part of the feeling. And you can, you know, music, you feel it, you hear it first. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is because we listen to nature, because all the noises we play on our, it's noises we, we are exposed to. And, and that same thing with food, in my opinion. We, the flavors we, we get exposed to is like finding the perfect strawberries and then you say, wow, and then making a dessert with it, you know, and 
but you don't want to mask the strawberry, but you want to compliment it. Mm -hmm. And take it in just a whipped cream and that's it. And sometimes the strawberry and the whipped cream can shine more than anything. You don't need a whole lot of other uh, leaves and branches to add to it to make it, oh, this is going to be the best. More, more is not necessarily better always. Okay. Does that make sense? And uh, to me, um, fi finding things that uh, always people ask me, you know, what should I eat? I said, what, you, what are you in the mood for? And I think sometimes people, you know, they don't think about it because they're, we're taught we go in a restaurant, they tell us what to eat or I have to eat what they give me. And I'm more like, I want to know what you feel like. I want to know whether, you know, because if you're in the mood for seafood, I give you meat, you're not going to be, you're going to say, I wish I had seafood. You know, you're not going to commit to it. And I think that's really important to to play that um, into the whole plate that we're gonna, uh, and that's what we do in the restaurant, try to do a menu. So I think about, okay, you're coming in and if you want beef, what kind of beef can I do? Or if you're doing vegetarian, for instance, uh, and what vegetables are more, uh, uh, you know, more palatable because um, I know people, for instance, squash is great, but if you love it, and then some people, they don't like the texture when it cooks, mm -hmm. or if you cook it too mushy, nobody will like it, or if you're too crisp. So those are things we play with. Um, and a lot of times things don't need to be cooked a lot, and less is more again, uh, because for instance, when I make chili, I cook it for hours, if you will. But if I'm cooking vegetables, it's quick. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a talent from Chinese cooking because the stir fry and the texture is there. You still, you still feel uh, and taste all the uh, flavor of the squash, if you will, without cooking it out. And one thing happens in cooking um, that the longer you cook, the more you cook the flavors out. For instance, I, one of the techniques I teach people is, uh, if you're using dry herbs, add it early. If you're using fresh, add some, but save some for when you're done and you add it last minute. Just give it a stir because you want to keep that potency there. You mm -hmm. don't want to cook it out. So for me, um, uh, I think, uh, again, every day is a different day. So uh, I'll, personally, I enjoy, you know, pastas. I think, uh, you know, um, I'm more of a homey, homey meals, <laughs> if you will. Um, but uh, on our menu, I think biggest thing I'm proud of, you know, we bring in a lot of great fresh seafood for bistro. And I, we're known for for having it, so I'm proud of those because I, if, if, and they know me because if the fish comes in and it's not what we think, it goes back. And I'm gonna tell the guests, say, this is, this is what you're gonna get today, not this one. And uh, uh, as far as Nash, is same thing. I mean, I, every day we look at and make sure the quality is there. And that's why the pizza is one of my pet peeves. When I go in every day, I, I make them make a pizza that tastes the dough. I want to know if the dough is right mm. because that's where it starts, mm -hmm. the bread. And food is all, you know, uh, I always tell people to eat, eat together because, you know, breaking bread, uh, you know, at Shabbat or, at the, you know, and in the evening. Those are things we forgot how to do because... Mm -hmm we decided we wanted to be so advanced that we have more time. Now we have no time. That's <laughs> so, right. You know, we, we've worked ourselves out of everything. We don't know, how, we don't have time to vacation or time to, uh, to do a little meditation. We don't have, I mean, you always want to, and I think with Corona, Corona has, I think, put a literally a reset button for, more, for everybody, I hope, to value 
what's what we have and mm -hmm. don't go after this promise of uh, beauty that is uh, material yeah and i think that's really what my take out of these times is that uh, i tease my friends i said oh you didn't know you have a backyard huh <laughs> <laughs> Or you have a kind of, you have a dining room table, and I talked to several friends. They said I'm tired of cooking. I said, "Yeah, cleaning is worse." <laughs> so you know, you just take the good with bad. That's but that's but I think uh, it's funny because when I was growing up, I was all watching these movies, and uh, a lot of them are, were American movies, and and that's all over the world, and. Uh, Every, you know, everybody had dinner and they, you know, they, they said grace or whatever and then everybody washed and dried dishes together. How many of us do that anymore? <laughs> yeah, it was probably a rude awakening when you came yeah. to America. Yeah, and so to me, uh, we need to go back to basics and enjoy the, the simpler life because we, I, I call it Hollywood. Hollywood sells us this, this mansions in the sky, and uh, and you know, of course, some people live it. But but then again, um, I always say, are they really? Is that the full happiness? Is uh, is that why we take three different medicines to uh, to feel better, or you know, and, feel calm? Right, and we can't have friends, so we have to hire. A, uh, psychiatrist to to hear us out or you know mm -hmm. I, I think uh, go to mom and talk or you know we need to go back to doing this a conversation mm -hmm. among friends and people you know uh, talk about the day talk about you know things that are bad or good yeah. um, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about where you were born, your childhood, what was your favorite food growing up? Like, because okay. you talked about like comfort food and, you know, when you were three years old or six years old, what was like your comfort food that like when things get hard, you want, you crave? Oh, uh, rice, definitely. <laughs> well, I was born in Iran and I was raised in Tehran. And my parents, uh, especially my mom from, was from Norden by Caspian Sea. And my father, uh, his, his father moved there to, to the north town of Rasht. And um, so I grew up because of my dad wanted always the foods from that region. He loved it and my mom always made fun of him because he tried to talk their accent and because they have a regional language in the Caspian and, Sea yeah. area, so uh, he he loved it. He embraced it. And my mom was always trying to talk the pro proper Farsi or English, if you will. And uh, so, and he always made fun of my mother. Said, "Well, I'm just having fun. I don't care." <laughs> but uh, the food there is uh, is everything is balanced. It's not overly. Sp it, the spice is not used to used a lot, like uh, peppers and all that. More more condiments is used, and uh, they use a lot of uh, different uh, herb and uh, sp uh, pe spicy pepper chutneys that you have it with your meal. It's not necessarily incorporated in me. And uh, and the very you know I, of course when I was growing up. It, Things weren't like today. I mean, we had we had to eat regional and seasonal mm -hmm. because you know until the age of airplane, food really traveled very slow. So you know today I can get a strawberry from Mexico that is picked two days ago. This wasn't you know when I grew up. It was. You know, you eat regional, you had strawberries when it was now. And then mm -hmm. three months later, you eat something else or cherries or what have you. So I, I think uh, this time of year, there was um, this uh, beans that are grew and uh, kind of like limes and all that, but you had to shell them. Mm. And uh, my mother prepared them always. Uh, and that's a Northern preparation. And it's sort of vegetarian. And that's really uh, 
I, I think it was age five, I turned vegetarian because um, uh, it's very common to give, um, to, to give uh, when you have a good, my father did uh, a business or whatever, it was very uh, fruitful. So you give something and in, a, in a Easter there, you usually, you know, sacrifice a lamb and, you know, take the meat, give it to the, to uh, take it and give it to people. And, you know, so you, and um, I basically watched my lamb getting uh, <laughs> sacrificed, <laughs> mm. literally. So I did, for years, I didn't know why I, did, I wouldn't eat meat. My mother finally explained it to me when I was 14. Oh, you didn't remember seeing it. You just remembered that you couldn't uh, do it. I think the, when she told me, then the pictures came in. Mm. Literally, I went back and, and back part of it was such a dramatic because they woke me up in the morning to come look how we doing it. And I'm going, what do you mean? You just, uh, this thing is uh, hanging upside down. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, but, so trying to take the blood out of it or whatever the guts are hanging out. <laughs> so it was very dramatic. I think uh, I finally dealt with it, but uh, so I was able to, you know, go past it and uh but my biggest thing was these like these beans that she would um they would come in season and they were hard because you had to take three different shells off oh wow and and it takes a lot of time for a little cup like this so two ounces three ounces it took two hours yeah. so she prepared that with dill and garlic and uh, classically in you know, uh, when if there is no protein in the in the dish, they usually use egg, or you use like a you know a meat or something. So eggs were used also a lot as a protein substitute in the, in the meals for northern cooking, especially because they eat a lot of greens and vegetables as part of the meal. And uh, uh, I think for Iranian culture or generally Eastern or even here for years meat uh meat was what you hunted mm -hmm. not necessarily what you raised always mm -hmm. because that was commodity you know so uh and i think um i finally worked my way up to to meat and i ate meat again but i think that's if i have to say that the, the that bean dish sticks with me i you know or eggplant is still is one of my favorite dishes and then as a, as a Persians, we take pride in our rice cooking. I think we really uh, uh, like to brag about it. <laughs> what makes Persian rice different than... It's, uh, well, it's the techniques they use. There's like two, two or three different, uh, you know, there's a pilaf, then there's a steamed rice. And, and then the, uh, there is like a different variety of rice for different dishes I and mean, some rice uh, like uh, japanese is the mm -hmm. round rice is for sushi is for instance or sweet rice and uh, so you know and uh, nowadays we have basmati so that's kind of like you know uh, uh, they use it for steam rice a lot because mm -hmm. it's, it, 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 it cooks better that way so uh, and then what we add to the rice. It's kind of like uh, an Indian cooking, they call it biryani. So they layer the rice with different, whether it's mixture of cabbage or herbs, whether it's mixture of lambs or barberries, cherries. I mean, I, I can go on name rice all day and uh, everything is different flavor or different variation of it. So which, uh, because it's a staple there, so people learn not just have the steamed rice now you can go mm -hmm. take it to another level make a dish with it so that's the persian secret <laughs> awesome well one of the things we like to ask our um our guests is if you had to make a recipe for peace what would it be and it could be a literal recipe like the food that you would prepare or it could be more metaphorical what would be your recipe for peace? I think uh, this is a tough question. <laughs> uh, because I asked my wife every day, do you need anything? She said, world peace. I said, I'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
So I'm working on it. And uh, I think uh, uh, for me, uh, food has to be shared. And doesn't matter is bread and cheese or bread and olive oil and you dip it in there, you break a bread, you hand it to each other and you dip it in oil or salt or whatever it is and eat it. I think that's what the best thing ever because when you, when you share that meal with everybody, it just tastes better, always. So to me, um, if I have to have a recipe with peace uh, for peace, <laughs> I'll say you got to put the love in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you can't you can't make a great dish without being passionate about it. You can't make peace without being passionate about peace. Uh, you have to want to do the best, and so being passionate about your uh, your love for the world. I think that's, you know, and, and love is such a, uh, uh, it's catching, you know, it's kind of like a yawn, uh, if you, if you want to put it in that perspective or a smile. And, uh, when you smile, people smile, mm -hmm. but we, you know, we try to teach people don't smile. They, then they don't take you seriously. Well, we take this life too seriously, I think, sometimes. <laughs> life is simple. I mean, you know, we come in this world <clears throat> with, a, with very vulnerable and we leave this world that way because everything stays here. Mm -hmm. Just us are transiting. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that um, I really admire is how you've been very open about your battle with illness and your own healing journey. And I'm aware that our world is in need of healing right now as well. Um, I wonder if you have any insights about healing um, that, that can help those Help people, you know, I think, you know, we, we talk about hate, first of all, you know, in general. I think it's very important that uh, we, uh, we, we, we abolish hate, I don't know, but, <laughs> but we need to literally take that word and kind of put it aside. I think um, the really um, going through the journey of whether illness or I'm, I'm very lucky, first of all, I have a lot of good people around me to support me. I think without that, it's not as easy. A loving family and friends and community. But uh, also what's important is um, I, don't, I don't hate my illness. I try to figure out uh, how I can live with it. Mm. how I can um, overcome it. And sometimes uh, there is no answers. And or we, I know the answer. There is, you know, like uh, it can go either way. It's, uh, it's not very uh, cut dry, you know. And, but also I know we're, we're, I'm a traveler. Um, I can't make myself stay in this world forever. Mm. And so that to me is not important is how I live my time that I have now. Mm -hmm. I think if I have to say that is more important for me. What I, what I, what I, what I really experience, what I see every day, and, uh, whether, uh, how I leave the world that I found when I was a child. Uh, did I do my best to get it a little better. I mean, we're talking about recipe of peace because if we all did a little bit less uh, being less selfish or less uh, focus on uh, having more just more sharing more uh, more uh, more understanding and more and it's going to be a lot easier. I think a lot of times 
uh, one of the major cause of illness is stress. Mm -hmm. And our stress nowadays, is our stress is by our jobs or by our financial or whatever it is. And we have to take that, uh, you know, out of our, our lives and make it, you know, uh, again, spend time more with people, get their positive energy because mm -hmm. Uh, that's going to help healing. I mean, prayer, for instance. Uh, or people say, oh, send some good energy to so-and-so. I'm a, I'm a very, um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a believer of that because when I can give the energy, I can send energy. And I think if we put more positive energy into our society, in our, uh, into our body even, uh, is more important. And one of the things is important for me, I learned throughout being in a food business or what have you, but that was before. I listened to my body and I, I always said, we are what we eat. And to me, uh, it's very important where my food comes from. So I, I think that has a lot to do with it or how much of I, I eat it. I always said, you can spurge, but you got to do it in moderation. Again, uh, to stay healthy, you got to do that. And use uh, a lot of times food, actually, if you think about it, is where fuel or it gives us energy. And so we have to eat the positive foods, if you want, much <laughs> more than, you know, sugar or, you know, a lot of fats or what have you. So it's a balance, again. But for me, it's important that uh, I, I live for today. Mm -hmm. I always say, you know, uh, we need to take care of today. Uh, I can do something about today. Uh, yesterday's gone and uh, I, you know, I hope I did my best, but I learned. And uh, if I need to, you know, do things differently, but you gotta learn. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow's opportunity. Absolutely. I noticed um, your lovely wife, Paula. <laughs> who is, um, she, got, she got my cup full. <laughs> passing by, and I, I don't want to put her on the spot, but I wonder if she has any um, reflections on, because sometimes people who know us and love us see aspects of us that other people don't see, or we don't even see ourselves, like if we were to ask my spouse, like, she would have a different perspective on me. Um, she will talk to you. <laughs> so, but I mean, what what are your thoughts about sort of Chef Chef Anusha's spiritual creative process towards cooking and life in five minutes? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you know, actually, hang on, I have something I'll be right back. Okay, awesome. Uh oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I want to acknowledge her. I know she's been a partner to you in so many ways. Well, uh, you know, uh, as much as uh, we like to brag, we do everything ourselves. You know, and when we're a kid, oh, look at me standing, look at me running. Mm. But we can't do any of it without other people encouraging us. And uh, we can't do any of it without other people uh, being part of it. I mean, you know, uh, what did yeah. you, oh, she got. Oh, I don't know. Can you, can you see this? Close. Sort of, yeah. Let's it's an uh, interfaith. Uh, it's, it's, it's everything. Mm. It's all religions. When, uh, if you if you've gone with people and you're you're their person to fill out paperwork, which I am for Noosh, and you go to the hospital a lot, um, which unfortunately we did quite a bit, um, and they ask you every time, "What religion are you?" Mm -hmm. And Anoush always says the same thing of everything, yeah. because it's all good. Yeah. And a friend gave me this after I was telling somebody that because they just didn't understand it. He also though. If he fills out his own paperwork, when they ask, are you pregnant? He puts yes. So, <laughs> so, 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 you know, that's pretty much the essence of a news. <laughs> people laugh. And he, 
very much it's it's all good i'm very and, confusing <laughs> you know pregnant with potential and with <laughs> new recipes and um you know definitely uh post-gender in some ways right <laughs> um, yeah the so i i love that i really <laughs> do i mean it's I mean, very much so. I can't tell you the number of times that we've been in our waiting room and we've had conversations with so many people and their whole life after they've talked to Anoush, it's like it's just lighter and you can mm. almost see where they see there's hope. Mm. And that if somebody who, who does have a really crummy diagnosis, my husband has a really crummy diagnosis and we know that we're buying every day is a gift. Oh, and wow. Um, we're buying time, but we are all buying time. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the fact that we have friends across the board that, um, you know, most people just don't know what to do with the niche. So when, you know, they, they think that he might, you know, is he Muslim? Is he Jewish? Is he Catholic? Is he, <laughs> is he a Druid? Is he a, um, anything? And, and so truly the, the, this necklace with everything and, yeah. and I get asked about it a lot, and I'm really grateful to be able to tell people that we're all connected. And the spirit and the universe, when we look out and we look at the, at the trees, that we're connected, that we're a piece of all of us. But he... Well, all the religions are teaching, teaching love and faith, faith, the whole world of word faith. You gotta have faith. We say we have to have faith in things, you know, and uh, they all have the same message in a different format, in a different way. And I, I understand we're all different, so we can't ask everybody be, you know, uh, not everybody understands things the same. But, but at the end of the day, uh, when you preach love, is there a better love or different love they all love, love is love to me i mean and uh when i hug when i hug you i you know i get the same energy that i hug your hair or you know someone you know from different faith or my catholic friends and you know but i do believe that uh, having faith into what you believe in but also follow what you believe in mm. you know the follow the good not but not the bad this is um as we would say in my religion good torah it's uh, yes. wisdom. Yes. but i love that this is my religion and you show everything um, <laughs> that's wonderful and certainly speaks to what we at interfaith peace have to peace try to share and um you know even your definition of prayer, which is energy, is absolutely what my own definition of prayer is. Um, right. And I love how you talk about even your cooking for someone is about that conversation of energy where you're sharing and pouring love and energy into them and right. you're trying to hear what, you know, what is going to be comforting for them and creating something that'll connect energetically into where they need that healing and that soul food it's just beautiful one of the things i did one of the schools i went when i was uh, in uh, you know high school was zoroastrian high school in iran and uh, we weren't zoroastrian by all means but but uh i was i think <laughs> and uh you know they have uh, three things uh, good thoughts good deeds good words and that's the, the, the whole thing. I mean, you know, we have 10 commandments or all the, sometimes that's all, the, all you need is, mm -hmm. you know, to just think and say positive things. I think we're, uh, um, we talk about bullying. I think we have a lot of that going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because it makes us better when we demean others, when we literally uh, try to knock other people down so we can look better. And what, whether we are a kid in a high school or preschool or when, or somebody in a high office. So it's sad that we, you know, we, we don't 
build people, right? We, we should rather build people than tear them down. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing some of your positivity and wisdom and light with us. Um, thank you both. Oh, thank you. And, uh, oh, hi, Jed. Hey, Paul. Hey, y'all. Yeah, I just wanted to say it's been such a joy to listen uh, to you and Ocean. Um, you kind of exemplify this uh, soul f feeding us uh, not only our bodies, but our souls with your words and food and presence. And I just want to offer a, a, a little kind of interfaith uh, blessing to you right now. And um, so may God and the God beyond God bless you and keep you. May God be gracious and kind to you and continue to love you and the world through you. Thank you for being you and blessings. We are deeply grateful as a community for you to be in it. And thank you for feeding us. And I appreciate all you do because the positivity you all spreading and the faith you give in every individual i think is more important now than ever all of you you know i'm mm. grateful for that well we are nourished by you. you and it's a reciprocal relationship and we are sending lots of love light and healing energy towards both of you and um, may you continue to be blessed as you are a blessing thank you so much thank you Thank you. And thank you for helping us inaugurate our Soul Food for the City program. You are our first chef, and um, we are truly blessed. Um, so next week, we actually have um, the chef from Dakshin, who's going to be talking oh, about right. um, his approach to food and healing. Tomorrow morning, we've got yoga that you can have. It's a uh, yoga um, my place for yoga, Lisa from My Place for Yoga is going to be Lisa. Us, so, if, if you have a chance to talk to uh, Salam from uh, Queen of Sheba, um, highly recommend talking with her food and spirituality. She's pretty awesome. Mm. Well, I will be um, put that put that on put her on your list. And she's we her will happily. Her. And our food is phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I yeah, it is. Sure, sure does. We have an amazing um, city that loves its food and its restaurants, and that I think now more than ever has been appreciating what an important part of our community that is. Um, so thank you for all that you have done and are doing for our community. And well, what well, the, what what makes our city good is people. Mm -hmm. Like you, like I, I swear I wanted to move many times, but this city is so compact, <laughs> so good, and I can't. And it's the people. It is. And somebody said, "Can you have a city without people?" I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's true. I've left the city and come back myself because it's right. special, and I pray that right now it is having the reckoning that it needs so that it can live its values even more fully. Mm -hmm. okay. And thank you, thank you. Thank you all. Blessings. Blessings to you all. Thank you.